It is impossible to tell the story of Auschwitz. Our head refuses. We can't even conceive of the death of a child or understand what it means. So how can we conceive of the death of millions of people? Six million people. When you hear that story, when you read it, you sometimes think, even I sometimes think, it's unthinkable. May the 8th, 1945, the Second World War ended in Europe, and with it, the war waged by Hitler against the Jews. It took the lives of six million men, women, and children. After the war, the death camps were liberated. Most of the executioners were killed or took flight. Jews in Europe who survived were left with nothingness. The world they came from had disappeared. Thousands were left rootless and set off in search of a new home. Many would find it in the promised land, Palestine. In Jerusalem, we'd hear people wailing in the night when they had nightmares. I didn't understand what they were saying, but they'd shout out at night. We saw people with a number tattooed on their arm. We knew that something horrible had happened in Europe, but we didn't know what. In our neighborhood, there was a man with a little workshop. We kids would call him one million children. He didn't speak Hebrew very well, but when we passed him, he'd say, one million children. They killed one million children like you. They killed one million children like you. In the West, the term Holocaust has become synonymous with the Jewish genocide. Jews call it the Shoah, the catastrophe. Survivors were haunted by a constant fear of death. The scars, both physical and psychological, would never leave them. They are returning from hell. You should have seen them. Each one was wearing four shirts, three pullovers, two coats. They were wearing everything they owned. They had lots of children. They were returning from nothing. Nothing anybody had ever seen before. They were returning from Auschwitz. Three months before the end of the war, on January the 27th, 1945, the Red Army arrived in Auschwitz. This camp was not only the Nazis' largest death factory, it was also their largest labor camp. It's like walking through a small city. You have rows and rows of barracks and the different streets you walk down. These take on really industrial proportions by the summer of 42 when Himmler improves the creation of the four factories of death at, at uh, Birkenau. To dupe their victims, the camp's gas chambers were disguised as showers. But most of the victims knew very well what lay in store for them. We have testimony from some of the guards who saw parents talking quietly to their children and pointing up at the sky. In Auschwitz, French painter David Oller was a prisoner of the Sonderkommando, or Special Commando. He was forced to carry the corpses from the gas chambers to the crematoriums. David Oller recorded the terrible scenes of his daily life as drawings. These are among the most important eyewitness accounts of mass murder in Auschwitz. Taking photographs of the gas chambers and crematoria was strictly prohibited. As the Red Army approached, Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, gave the order to destroy Auschwitz and all the death camps. 
These places never were liberated by anyone because they ceased to function when the Red Army arrived. The Soviets came to Auschwitz by chance. We know they didn't deviate from their route to go and liberate the camp. The massacre had already finished and traces of the massacre had been destroyed. The concentration camp inmates, still able to walk before the liberation, were sent west. Tens of thousands of them died on the way. Auschwitz, too, was evacuated ten days before its liberation. The evacuation plans were put in place by Himmler in the summer of 1944. And many camps in the path of the advancing allies in Western Europe were evacuated in August, September, October, November of 1944. In the winter of 1944-1945, the entire command structure of the Third Reich begins to break down. And the commanders of the concentration camps are aware that the Russians in the East particularly are getting closer and closer and closer. They're very panicky. But they are not setting out to kill the prisoners. Even at the end of the war, in the last months, the Third Reich regarded the prisoner population as a valuable labor force. And the purpose of the evacuation was to move the prisoners from a place where they might fall into the hands of the advancing allies to places, factories, farms, mines, where they could do something useful for the Third Reich's war effort. And it may seem crazy for the Nazis to believe that they were still fighting a war or that they had a war effort, but they did believe that they could carry on. Tens of thousands of prisoners from the concentration camps were crossing Hitler's Reich, which was shrinking before his eyes. Short of food, they were forced along by the SS guards threats. The planned evacuation turned into the march of death. Sometimes the guards got together and they said, look, they're slowing us down. We could run away much more quickly if we just killed them. And what are they? They are enemies. And they smell and they're ill. Who cares? Prisoners who couldn't go any further were slaughtered along the way, often in front of the local population. Thousands of them died of hunger and cold. So the extraordinary and terrible slaughter in the last months of the war was not planned. It wasn't deliberate. These marches ended up from tens of thousands in death, but they were not death marches. They were evacuations that collapsed into chaos. Most of those who survived Auschwitz found themselves in the western camps, which were Buchenwald, Mauthausen, Bergen-Belsen, all those camps liberated by the advancing allies. By the autumn of 1944, American troops had reached the western border of Germany. Alan Dulles was the head of the OSS, the head of the um, American intelligence abroad, later became head of the CIA. When he was told of the concentration camps, he's, his response was very interesting. He said, ah, so it's true. He had all the information, all the information. He didn't believe it was true. I took a jeep to get to Dachau. There were bodies strewn all over the place. Bodies by the dozen. I thought, they're just puppets. It's like a puppet theater. They can't be human. But they were humans, people just like me. The 
the survivors were cared for medically and fed by the Allies. By the end of the war, most of them were living in DP camps, displaced person camps, the visitors' reception centers. When it came to organizing their future, their next home, their new life, the survivors of the Shoah had to do it themselves. The trauma they suffered took on the status of a disease. It was called Survivor Syndrome. The war stopped, but for the Jews, the suffering, the dying, the grief continued. The persecution and the genocide, while it may have stopped on the 8th of May 1945, continued to have terrible effects on all of their lives. There were hundreds of thousands of displaced Jewish people. There were Jewish parents trying to find their children. There were orphaned children trying to find their way back to their communities. They had no idea what their future was, where they would go. I had no one in Israel. And I felt like an orphan. Alone. I knew absolutely no one there. They gathered us together and took us to Israel. We didn't speak any Hebrew. They put all of us children together, and then a socialist in a red shirt came. He shouted at us. We were only 13 or 14, like sheep to the slaughter. Never again. That implied that we'd done something wrong, that we'd gone like sheep to the slaughterhouse. But here in Israel were not lambs you could lead to the slaughter. It was a kind of black humor. While the survivors attempted to make a fresh start, the Allied victors wanted justice to be done. After the war, the Allies went after the most prominent Nazi leaders for the international trial. Naturally, the question was, who should be brought to justice? Who were the culprits? So many people were involved, so who was to blame? The Allies chose the easy way out. We'll prosecute those at the head of the regime. They selected the 24 most important Nazis, with the exception of the one at the top, Hitler. The Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, Germany, once the holy city of Nazism, becomes the setting of an epic event. Here, under the vigilant eyes of Allied military police, the 20 most important surviving members of the Hitler gang go on trial. The attention of all the world is centered on this city and this scene. The trial gave a distorted picture of reality. It put the high-ranking officials in the foreground and left to one side all those who had carried out their orders, all very accommodating for the Germans. The final solution, the mass murder of the Jews, is simply one among a number of items that are lumped together and is not separated out as being particularly distinct. April the 15th, 1946. Rudolf Hirsch, former commandant of Auschwitz, was heard by the military court in Nuremberg. Sie waren von 1940 bis 43 Lagerkommandant von Auschwitz und in dieser Zeit sind Hunderttausende von Menschen dort in den Tod geschickt worden. Ist das richtig? Jawohl. Ist es weiter richtig, dass Ihnen Eichmann erklärte, insgesamt seien in Auschwitz über zwei Millionen jüdische Menschen vernichtet worden. So richtig. Im Sommer 1941 wurde ich persönlichen Befehlsempfang zum Reichsführer SS Himmler nach Berlin befohlen. Dieser sagte mir dem Sinne nach, der Führer hat die Endlösung der Judenfrage befohlen. Wir, 
die SS haben diesen Befehl durchzuführen. Himmler has said on several occasions that the Führer has placed on my shoulders the heavy responsibility for carrying out this his, his, uh, task of, um, of uh, removing the Jews. And Himmler spoke openly about this in, to his SS leaders and the party leaders in a way that Hitler never did and never could do uh, in, in his notorious speeches in Posen in, um, in 1943. Ein ganz schweres Kapitel will ich hier vor Ihnen aller Offenheit nennen. Es soll zwischen uns ausgesprochen sein und trotzdem werden wir nicht in der Öffentlichkeit nie darüber reden. Ich meine die Judenevakuierung, die Ausrottung des jüdischen Volkes. Es gehört zu den Dingen, die man leicht ausspricht. Das jüdische Volk wird ausgerottet. Das sagt Ihnen jeder Parteigenosse. Ganz klar steht in unserem Programm drin, aus Zeitung der Juden, Ausrottung, machen wir ha, Kleinigkeit. A few dozen meters away, we could see the convoys arriving from all the countries in Europe. We witnessed the selection. Three or four hundred meters further on were the crematoria. People would enter in long lines. And then they all come to the brave 80 million people. Everyone has their own unstinging Juden. Sagt, alle anderen sind Schweine, der ist ein prima Jude. <lacht> Und zugesehen, er ist durchgestanden, hat keiner. Von euch werden die meisten wissen, was es heißt, wenn 100 Leichen beisammen liegen. Wenn 500 da liegen oder wenn 1000 da liegen. I asked the adults, how many Jews are there in France? How many are there in Norway? How many in Italy? And one after the other, they swallowed and disappeared. And this to And dabei, abgesehen von menschlichen Ausnahmeschwächen, anständig geblieben zu sein, hat uns hart gemacht und ist ein niemals genanntes und niemals zu nennendes Ruhmesblatt. Wir haben das moralische Recht, wir hatten die Pflicht unserem Volk gegenüber das zu tun, dieses Volk, das uns umbringen wollte, umzubringen. My mother and I were separated. She left without looking back, without giving me a last look. She just walked away, getting smaller and smaller. I remember her clothes floating in the wind. I've often thought of that thing. I found incomprehensible the fact that she didn't once look back. Since 1942, the SS commandos had been erasing all traces. No evidence must remain of the massacre of the Jews. By the time the Allies brought the main war criminals to justice, all the leaders, Hitler, Himmler and Heydrich, were dead. Adolf Eichmann, organizer of the Holocaust, was on the run. The victors needed evidence in order to hunt down other criminals. The first assignment that I had was go to Berlin and collect the evidence necessary to prove the guilt of all these categories of people. So I had a staff of about 50 people and we combed through the Nazi offices, the foreign ministry, the SS, the Gestapo, whatever had not been bombed out and even in the ruins of what had been bombed out, to find the evidence. At Benjamin Ferenc's first trial, it was the commanders of the SS intervention units who were in the dock, units created by the SS General Reinhard Heydrich to intervene in the occupied Soviet Union. Heydrich calls together all the heads of department, all of the officers of the head office of the SS, and he says in very broad, in very general terms, I have a special mission. 
for you. It's going to be hard work. I can't say too much about it, but I want volunteers who are going to go with our forces into Russia to do special tasks. The invasion of the Soviet Union by Hitler, the largest military operation in history, began on June the 22nd, 1941. Four million German soldiers and their allies followed Heydrich's units, the Einsatzgruppen. These 3,000 men had a mission, to invade the region and enlist local help to kill the communist civil servants and Jews. For the native population, the Ukrainians and the Lithuanians, this is viewed, the Nazis come and say, we're out to get rid of Jews and Bolsheviks. This makes perfect sense in the mind of the locals who have experienced the last two years as a Bolshevik regime supported and welcomed by the Jews. And you have this explosion of resentment and frustration and rage that the Nazis stir up and approve. The German propaganda machinery exploited and amplified the alleged or suspected atrocities of the Russians to make the people rise up against their Jewish fellow citizens. With Messern, Äxten, Handgranaten and Maschinengewehren wurden diese unschuldigen Opfer bolschewistischer Mordgier grausam gemartert und hingeschlachtet. The first thing that the Germans found were mountains of bodies of Ukrainian nationalists with alongside always one or two survivors who said to the Germans it was the Jews who did it. So for these men of Einsatzgruppen who were told, as were all Weimarks men, that they were entering a land of cruelty, violence and fear, the first violence they experienced wasn't them shooting anyone, it was the violence of others. In July 1941, German troops conquered the Soviet city of Lemberg. Driven to revolt by the Einsatzgruppen, the city's inhabitants hunted down their Jewish fellow citizens. The men of Einsatzgruppen weren't chosen for their taste, for the slaughter, or for their experience. They were men of no more than 19 or 20. Before joining Einsatzgruppen, they weren't born killers. They were people who faced with their first shootout didn't know what to do. Sometimes even made them sick. Initially, the Einsatzgruppen only had orders to kill Jewish male adults. Before being shot, the victims had to dig their own graves. In order to kill quickly and efficiently on the front, the Einsatzgruppen needed logistic support. This was provided by the German army, the Wehrmacht. During the war in the east, a kind of division of labor between the Wehrmacht and the SS came into being. Of course, the high command and the Wehrmacht officers knew very well what these Einsatzgruppen were doing, because these massacres left blatant traces behind them. It was the head of the SS, Himmler, who personally gave the order to the Einsatzgruppen to kill all the Jews, women and children included. A kind of communication between marksmen sprang up, with two marksmen for a woman and her child. One aimed at the child, the other at the woman. Then the woman and child were separated and then shot. With the shooting of children, a new stage had been reached, and that stage was clearly genocide. To make Germany strong and great again, you can't afford to be compassionate 
That is the mentality of the Einsatzgruppen. And I think this helps to explain why they don't have much of a problem with mass murder on a vast scale. We shall show that these deeds of men in uniform were the methodical execution of long-range plans to destroy ethnic, national, political, and religious groups which stood condemned in the Nazi mind. Genocide the extermination of whole categories of human beings was a foremost instrument of the Nazi doctrine. Before the trial of the Einsatzgruppen began, I was approached by one of the defense lawyers for a defendant by the name of Dr. Otto Rush. And uh, Dr. Rush's lawyer said to me, you have to drop the case against Rush. And I said, why? He said he's suffering from Parkinson's disease. I said, what's Parkinson's disease? He said, well, he's shaking all the time. I said, if I killed so many people, I'd be shaking all the time too, because he did the Babi Yar job, 33,771 Jews killed in two days. So I said, is he breathing? He said, yes, he's breathing. I said, well, if he's breathing, I'm going to indict the son of a bitch. On September the 29th, 1941, all the Jews in Kiev, the recently conquered Ukrainian capital, were summoned to report to the station. They had to bring with them any valuables and warm clothing they may have, under the pretext that they were being moved. But from the station, the SS herded the Jews of Kiev towards the Babi Yar ravine. Whoever couldn't keep up was summarily shot. These were educated people who were kind, I'm sure, to their cats and dogs. Uh, they were quite nice, you know, educated Germans. Uh, the list of my six SS generals among my defendants, most of, most of the defendants have doctor's degrees. When they arrived at Babi Yar, the men of the Einsatzgruppen took all the victims' valuables. They then forced them to undress and lie down on the corpses already strewn across the bottom of the ravine. An Einsatzgruppen man came back up the line and shot each one in the skull. The valuables, clothing and underwear belonging to the 33,000 victims were gathered and distributed to non-Jewish inhabitants of Kiev. I began my statement there against 22 mass murderers who had murdered over a million Jews in cold blood, including thousands of children, shot one at a time. My lead defendant, Dr. Otto Oladorf, who had a law degree and an economics degree, who was the father of five children, gave what I think was the best explanation of why they had committed these crimes and their mentality. Will you explain to the tribunal why you believe that the type of execution ordered by you, namely military, was preferable to the shooting in the neck uh, procedure adopted by the other Einsatz groups? Auf der einen Seite sollte damit erreicht werden, dass die einzelnen Führer und Männer auf militärische Weise durch Befehl die Hinrichtung vollziehen konnten und daher keinen eigenen Entschluss zu fassen brauchten, sondern lediglich auf Befehl, auch äußerlich handelten. Zum anderen war mir bekannt, dass bei den Einzelhinrichtungen durch seelische Erregungen sich Misshandlungen nicht vermeiden ließen da die Opfer zu früh von ihrer Hinrichtung erfuhren und daher nervenmäßig einer längeren Belastung nicht standhielten. Ebenso erschien es mir unerträglich, dass 
einzelne Führer und Männer diese Weite gezwungen wurden, in eigenem Entschluss eine große Zahl von Tötungen vorzunehmen. All of the defendants were convicted. 13 of them were sentenced to death. Only four were executed, and the rest of them, a few years later, were turned loose. There were 3,000 members of the Einsatzgruppen. Every day, they went out and shot Jews and others for no reason, except their own ego and their own distorted theory of Aryanization and superiority. What happened to the 3,000 men? Nothing, nothing. Was there justice done? And what is justice? To talk about justice is really totally inadequate. While the victors were looking to hold the main culprits to account, the rest of Germany had to be liberated from the influence of National Socialism. During what became known as denazification, more than two and a half million Nazi functionaries, including members of the SS and the Wehrmacht, were checked. But only a tiny percentage of the culprits, around 5,025, were convicted. Denazification, although I believe it, it began with the best of intentions and the best motivations, uh, again, it was a victim of the Cold War. A new enemy exists, the Russians. And we have to get on well with the Germans. So it's no longer politically expedient to expose Nazi crimes. Und aus Stahlhelmen werden Siebe für den Haushalt. Die Waffenschmieden der Welt produzieren nicht mehr das, was die Menschheit fürchtet, sondern das, was sie braucht. There were thousands of individuals who slipped through the net. The Cold War was beginning. There were lots of factors. And there was the fact that society must go on. It must continue to be structured to have its leaders. The men who knew how to do that had mostly the same profile. They're 40, lawyers with a certain experience. All these men came from, in fact, the administration of the Third Reich. Many of these leaders had a Nazi past. Only 177 defendants were tried at Nuremberg. 24 were sentenced to death, 20 to life imprisonment, and 98 to a variety of terms. Only 13 of the 24 executions were carried out. The post-war German justice system slowed down cases against former Nazi culprits. In fact, many judges had a Nazi past, and almost all of those charged explained that they were only following orders. All the major criminals who hadn't been arrested in 44 or 45 were living freely and returned to their occupations with impunity. They all had careers afterwards, in fact, sometimes great careers. In 1952, Israel and West Germany signed an agreement whereby Germany committed to paying reparations for the Holocaust. The word reparation seemed an unfortunate choice. We should have struck it from the dictionary. Reparations has connotations of forgiveness. They should have changed the wording. The return of assets stolen from the Jews, maybe, but not reparations. The state paid in the name of the state. But companies and factories also benefited from the money and the work of the Jews. And they haven't coughed up a cent. The destruction of many documents during the war, such as instruments of incorporation of German firms, prevented them finding out to whom compensation should be paid. The uh, IG Farben people with whom I was negotiating said, no, we don't know how many Jews there were, blah, 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 blah. It was a mission impossible. 
And they finally agreed to pay a relatively small sum of money to settle the matter and get it out of the way. What was shocking was that insurance companies were also trying to get away with dragging things out until people died. They said that the evidence was insufficient and that the next appeal would recalculate everything. The apparent docility with which the victims agreed to commit crimes seems, in particular in Israel, just as incomprehensible as the crimes committed by the German executioners. They were asked, why didn't you refuse? We, Israelis, wouldn't have stood for that. That conveyed a certain heroic image. We Israelis are heroes. We wouldn't have let ourselves be exterminated by the Nazis. The victims were ashamed, perhaps because they didn't fight hard enough, perhaps because they were slaughtered like lambs. In effect, Ben-Gurion said, if you hadn't survived at the expense of another, you wouldn't be alive today. There was a widespread perception that survivors of the Shoah were guilty. The good guys had died. David Ben-Gurion was a Polish Jew. After emigrating to Palestine in 1906, he became, in 1949, the first elected Prime Minister of Israel. His position was no more Shoah, no more Shoah, no past, just the future. People assimilated that, as did the children of Shoah survivors. Hmm? This feeling endured right up to the Eichmann trial. After his arrest, he was taken to Jerusalem to be tried, and all that came to an end. Adolf Eichmann, organizer of the deportations, was the highest-ranking official of the Holocaust still alive. After the war, he lived in Argentina under false names until 1960, when he was found by Israeli agents. <laughs> At the opening of the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, many people were shocked when Eichmann walked through a door and into the famous glass booth because he looked like your uncle. He looked like an accountant, a small businessman, bald, spectacled, wearing a dark suit with a tie. He didn't look like the man who had sent hundreds of thousands of Jews to the death camp. During the trial, people were almost fighting to tell their story. The survivors of the Shoah found themselves in an unexpected situation. The state needed their stories, stories no one had let them tell, they weren't listened to. No one was interested in them. The Eichmann trial enabled the people to rediscover the Shoah. They all listened to the radio religiously. And he played a role, that of the perfect subordinate. 
the gray, dull, unassuming functionary. Ich habe diese Befehle im Gegenteil mit dem größten Widerwillen entgegengenommen und trotz meiner wiederholtesten Bitten, mich von diesen Aufgaben auszunehmen und mich äh, von diesen Aufgaben zu entbinden, wurde seitens meines Vorgesetzten nicht entsprochen. Ich hatte diesen Befehl durchzuführen. Except that when you listen to Eichmann or you read Eichmann outside the scope of the trial, you're not natural in a trial, especially when you're trying to save your skin. But when you listen to Eichmann in his circle of friends, and we can because he's been recorded by his own friends, his friends, SS refugees in exile in Argentina, like himself, who would meet up to talk about the good old days and who would record each other because their project was a book on the history of the Third Reich. Well, when you listen to Eichmann on those tapes, which have mostly been transcribed, you hear something else again. The prosecution wanted to prove that Eichmann had come up with the plan of the final solution to destroy the Jews. Why? Because Hausner did not have Heydrich in the dock. He could not cross-examine Himmler or Müller, and he certainly couldn't cross-examine Adolf Hitler. He had Adolf Eichmann. So he, he made Adolf Eichmann responsible for all of the crimes of the Third Reich. But what makes Eichmann such a horrible person is that in the end it doesn't stop him from contributing to the process of mass murder. He didn't have the excuse of saying, I didn't know. He did know. He saw it. And then as he said in his own words, he sent the Jews to the butcher. When he was deporting trains to the east, he knew what the east meant. It meant shooting into pits. It meant gas vans. It meant pushing women and children into gas chambers. Israeli law stipulates that the death penalty can only be applied during wartime. This provision was waived in the case of Eichmann, who died by hanging on May the 31st, 1962. After the Eichmann trial, the legal drama of the Holocaust continued in Germany. Nine former SS officers who had taken part in the elimination of Jews in Treblinka concentration camp were tried in Dusseldorf in 1965. But missing from the dock was their superior, infamous camp commandant Franz Stangl. And Stangl reorganizes the camp, enlarges the number of gas chambers, they build extra gas chambers, and Treblinka then very quickly becomes the most lethal camp. Stangl said, I see Jews as a delivery that arrives and that must be destroyed. He had gotten used to not considering them as human beings, but as an inferior race that had to be exterminated. It was a death machine which worked very well without requiring lots of manpower. It was a factory of death. The Nazis had built Treblinka concentration camp close to the Warsaw Ghetto, the largest Jewish ghetto in Europe. Eichmann's trains delivered between 750,000 and 950,000 people to Stangl's gas chambers. On February the 28th, 1967, Camp Commandant Franz Stangl was deported to Germany by Brazil. There he was sentenced to life imprisonment, only to die six months later of a heart attack. 
In all, more than 300,000 people in Nazi Germany took part in the Holocaust. But only 7,000 of them, a measly 2%, were convicted. They're dead. The real criminals are dead because they were at least 30. Add 70 to that and they're all gone. Just a few dog bodies who were 20 or 25 who'd now be 90 or 95. The attempt to locate, to investigate, to prosecute men who are alleged to have committed Nazi war crimes now it's too late. It's too late because these men are too old. You cannot put men who are 90 years old or older on trial. In many German and European cities, we find Stolpersteine, literally stumbling blocks to the memory of Holocaust victims. The artist Gunter Demnick launched this initiative, which consists in placing little commemorative stones in front of the houses of Nazi victims. Around 50,000 of these stones have been laid. They are not universally popular. It's a clash of views. On the one hand, many feel that enough is enough. They've long wanted to draw a line under it and say, we know all that, what more do you want? But others are addressing it in very practical terms and they do it because they want to. Yeah, yeah. we also have students who think that we should talk about it less. On the other hand, many do take an interest. Um, daran sehr interessiert sind. Each year, on Yom HaShoah, or Remembrance Day, air raid sirens in Israel ring out at 10 a.m. The whole country stands still for two minutes. The survivors of the Shoah who came to Israel, and no one wanted to listen to them, are now in the same situation. Once again, no one wants to know. I receive many letters from children of survivors of the Shoah. They upset me. One of them wrote, My mother, whom I loved so much, survived the Shoah. She spoke very little, hardly at all. I understand now that, in a way, she was a very special woman. How come I didn't notice before? I was so blind. I knew the Shoah survivors carried a great burden within them, but I never asked. How could I have been so blind? Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance, Israel's national memorial. Through nine underground passages, the museum tells the story of the persecution of the Jews. Yad Vashem has also gathered more than 110,000 testimonies from survivors of the Holocaust. The heritage of the Shoah is still a part of modern Israel. It's sad to see that in Israel, Shoah survivors are very poorly treated. They are old people. They don't get any help from the state. They live in very difficult conditions. As they don't have a strong lobby, they get very little from the state. They've got a tiny bit more, but only because of a big demonstration in Jerusalem. Why do these old people have to fight for their rights? There are still 250,000 survivors of the Shoah living in Israel. 1,000 die every month. They went through hell. But today, some of them can't even afford to feed themselves. I met one of them. 
He never received any compensation from the Germans. The state should look after Shoah survivors far better than that. After all, it was they who built this state. On August the 6th, 2007, thousands of Holocaust survivors demonstrated in Jerusalem to demand more aid from the state. Their placards read, sorry for surviving. I find it shameful and absurd that the survivors of Israel be humiliated in this way and that they die of hunger. It's a real shame for the state of Israel. Seventy years on, the Holocaust is one page in history that is far from being turned. It stares back as both a warning and a challenge, in particular to Germany, land of the perpetrators. No line can be drawn under this. For Jews, Germany will never be a normal country. And I don't think Germans will ever feel normal. Because of history, the Germans cannot escape their history. On May the 10th, 2005, a memorial was erected in Berlin to the murdered Jews of Europe. Peter Eisenman, who designed the monument, declared, the vast scale of the Holocaust inevitably makes any attempt to represent it by traditional means an exercise in futility. I would say in the Holocaust, what, is, what separates it from most of these is the degree to which the Jewish threat that Hitler is destroying is so totally imaginary, is totally a fantasy in his own mind. The notion that somehow Germany is threatened if you don't kill a two-year-old Jewish baby in the Ukraine is total fantasy. The notion that this is uh, a, an infection of bacillus that you must treat in the way that uh, if there is any remnant left, then we haven't accomplished the goal. This disparity between the, the, the drastic measure of killing six million people and the fact that virtually none of those people posed any threat whatsoever to Hitler and the Germans.